Father, we thank you for your goodness. We've sung about your goodness and we thank you for your goodness. I thank you, Lord, because your word never returns void. In fact, Isaiah said, as the rain and the snow are sent and they seep into the ground, we pray the same would happen to your word this morning, that it would seep into our hearts, we ask. Holy Spirit, you are welcome and we ask that you'd open our eyes and open our ears in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you've got your Bibles, we're going to begin in Matthew 28, but we're also going to jump to two other important passages this morning as we make our way through the last section of our vision series. Bit of a catch-up if you haven't been with us for the last few weeks. I believe the Lord has called us to take his word to the people. We spoke a little bit about that last week, but I believe in the power of God's word. I believe that God's work, word does its own work. In fact, that's what we looked at last week in the parable of the sower, that if we sow the word both in here, yes, that's our commitment, but also uh, that we would be uh, those that would sow the word of God wherever we go. Um, My vision for this church, our vision for this church, is that it would be a church of missionaries that wherever you are, God has planted you in your workplace, God has planted you in your school, God has planted you wherever you are to be a missionary uh, for the gospel. And what a privilege that is, I believe, as we've looked at, that uh, what Jonah highlights is that Nineveh was always ready and always waiting for the obedient prophet. I believe the same for today. And so last week we looked at the power of God's word and sowing God's word. Today I want to look at the theme of making disciples. Um, Before we go any further, you know, we could, uh, particularly in the West, um, in fact, the the statement has been made and the statistics are supported that the church in the West is shrinking and people are saying, you know, the church is irrelevant. If you were in Iran today, or if you were in China today, you would not think the church is irrelevant. And in fact, you wouldn't think the church is shrinking at all. The church is advancing in some places very rapidly and very powerfully. And uh, a gentleman I listened to from the US actually has uh, partners with a church in Iran. And uh, they had a conference and they invited this pastor from Iran to come to America and to speak. And I thought what a powerful uh, statement this was. And the pastor said, if you could sum up the church in the West with one word, what would you use? And he said, asleep. He went on to say, if we realise the power that we had and the command that Christ has given us, it would change things. And, you know, we could talk about the ills of the church in the West for many weeks and many months. But uh, our vision here is to be a church that's part of the solution. And so uh, today I'm going to make the statement, and I'll back it up as we go along, discipleship fixes everything. And uh, we, as I expressed last week, we want to be a church that grows larger through evangelism and deeper through discipleship. And so today we're going to answer three questions. Why discipleship? What does a disciple or what does discipleship look like? And how do we get there as a church? We're going to answer those three questions. Uh, Next week and continuing into next year, on the Sunday night, we're going to have our corporate prayer meeting. And uh, we're going to be talking about world events. Thank you, Margaret. Margaret puts in a lot of work every month for the corporate prayer meeting, and we appreciate that. You know, we could talk about all the problems in the world. We could talk about all the problems in politics. We could talk about all the problems uh, maybe in our own lives. Or we could be part of the solution and turn up and pray. Prayer invites another power and another presence into our situation. And then all things are possible. Amen? Amen. Let me read some verses and then we'll work our way through this morning. First question is, why is discipleship so important? I guess the question should be, why is it not as important as it should be? Uh, Matthew 28, verse 16, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. (laughs) That's an interesting phrase. Jesus has risen, he's appeared to you, but you've still got some lingering doubts. Sound like anybody in the room? It's probably all of us at some point in our Christian journey. Verse 18, Jesus doesn't condemn them, by the way. I love that about Jesus. Verse 18, Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. 
Go therefore and make disciples. Uh, if you've got your hard copy this morning, then underline the words, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So this morning, as we ask ourselves the question, why discipleship, uh, we'll look at what it looks like in a moment, and we will answer the question how we get there towards the end. But Jesus says to go into all the world. By the way, the only command in this passage, the only command in the Greek is make disciples. The word go is a present participle. The word teach and the word baptize is a present participle. So Jesus is actually saying, be forever going, be forever baptizing, be forever teaching. But the command is to make disciples. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, what Jesus says here is, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. It's a delegation. And we are his representatives uh, he has delegated us both the right and the might, the authority and the power to achieve what he's commanded us to do. Uh, the best way I can understand, uh, I'm a very simple man, uh, the best way I can help you to understand this is most of us will have appreciated a football game at some point in time. Uh, AFL, that's real football in the Greek, uh, for those that are wondering. Uh, but uh, for those that are wondering, I've been to AFL matches, and obviously, obviously you have two sides. You have, you have maybe red Guernseys and blue Guernseys, uh, or whatever it may be. But there's actually three, uh, three representations on the field. There's the teams, and then there's the umpires. H how many people love the umpires? <laughs> what I love about the umpires is they make decisions, and they don't care what the crowd thinks. But what will happen throughout the course of the game is he, the umpire has a whistle and he has the authority given to him or her now, which is great, uh, him or her has been given the power and the authority by a higher delegation to enforce the rules of the book. They blow their whistle and they don't care what the crowd thinks and they've been put there to maintain the rules of the game, and God has given us that delegation. We are his referees on the field of life, and he's given us the book, and he's given us the authority, and he's given us the power yes. to blow the whistle yes. and enforce the precepts of the kingdom. That's what this statement means. It means I've given you all of the right and all of the might. Uh, I've also been at football matches where I thought the umpire was going to have to be chop it out very quickly. We've been there, Roscoe, have we not? Go and make disciples. Jesus says, make, I don't know where we got confused. In the Greek, this is one word. We use two words, but the, tense, the best way to understand the tense of this word in the Greek is the good old Nike saying of just do it. Here's what Jesus is saying. Go and make disciples. I've given you all of the authority and I've given you all of the power. Go and make disciples. Somewhere along the line, we've confused that. I get that. Somewhere along the line, we've, we've told Jesus we're going to build his church and he can go ahead and make disciples. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, as we covered last week, I will build my church. You go and make disciples. That's the command. Disciples make disciples which make disciples. If, if we have a look, last week I said uh, my heart for church is that uh, church is an orchard and not a factory. But if you have a look at how God has ordained everything in creation, trees reproduce themselves. Healthy trees reproduce themselves. If we're producing fruit, the seed is in the fruit to reproduce. Uh, healthy, mature disciples reproduce themselves. They are spreading the gospel as well as growing. So the mandate is that we are to make disciples. And part of the process of that is we're going, we're baptising and we're teaching. And, and on, the, on Team Jesus, there's no cheerleaders. What I mean by that is it's not a crowd of people sitting in a room cheering on, saying, you know what, God's called those two people over there to be the evangelists. And so it's up to the pastor and it's up to the evangelist to do all the evangelizing work. And it's up to the pastor to do all the teaching. Uh, even, if I was, uh, even if I was super, super intelligent, which I'm not, 
and educated. I do not have the ability to pastor a church full of people on my own. I can't do it. There's no cheerleaders. There's no sitting back applauding everybody else. Uh, By the way, when it comes to being used by God, God always uses those that are busy. When I was in football, I used to pass the ball to people who were on the field. If you're sitting on the bench and you're calling for the ball, if you want God to use you, get off the bench and get on the field. Maybe that's in the cafe to start with. Maybe it's in Kids Rock. Maybe wherever it is. Whenever God is looking for someone, he's looking for someone who's busy. Jesus says, go and make disciples. Why is our focus uh, intently going to be about growing people? That's what discipleship is. Discipleship is, Lord, we want to be a place where people can be planted and can be grown. A safe place uh, where God can do his deep work in our hearts and in our lives. The word disciple, we will unpack this more, what this looks like. But the word disciple means a disciplined follower. It's somebody who attaches themselves to a teacher. For the, for the three people that read the pastor's comments last week, a discipleship in the first century was about getting dust on your feet. That was the term. It was kind of like you're so close to the rabbi that you're walking behind him getting the, his dust on your feet. And so close that you could imitate every word, so close that you could imitate every thought. This is something that's going to become more apparent. Uh, A a disciple didn't just know information about the rabbi, they learnt their ways. Today, if we had a word today that best sums up what a disciple is and what that relationship looks like, we would use the word apprentice. Apprentice. For anybody who's been in the trade, an apprenticeship looks like you attach yourself to somebody else and you learn that trade from them. You learn uh, whatever it may be, but you spend a period of time with them. And they don't just get you to fill out a questionnaire in a textbook. Uh, You learn by doing and following and imitating the one who is above you. Dallas Willard, who has a lot to say about spiritual formation and a lot to say about discipleship, beautifully says that the Great Commission is still the mission statement of the church. It should be still the mission statement of the church. Big C Church, as in the body of Christ. Our mission statement should be, we should be going and our heart should be, we want to make disciples. So what does a disciple look like? For those that uh, are following through... In their, in their Bibles. If you'd like to turn to John chapter 6, when I was thinking about this and meditating on this, I thought there's no better passage that I would use to describe what my heart is. Uh, our heart here is when we say, uh, oh, what do you mean by disciple, pastor? Let me help you to understand that. Uh, as you're making your way to John chapter 6, let me give you a little bit of context. John chapter 6 begins with the feeding of the 5,000. And uh, what I love about the Gospel of John is that he uses the miracles, not not just as, hey, look at this, but it's more of a parable. It's more of a sign. And so the feeding of the 5,000 actually has a great lesson, both uh, to the greater crowd, but also to his disciples. Uh, later on, he would say to his disciples, how many basketfuls did you pick up? <laughs> well, we picked up 12 basketfuls, well, five loaves and two fish. The fish I catch could feed multitudes, but uh, five, fi- five loaves and two fish... How many basketfuls did you pick up? We picked up 12. What's the message to the disciples? I will always be more than enough for you. What's the message to the little boy with five fish and two loaves? It doesn't matter what you have, but when you put it in the right hands... And many people get their fill. Many people have... It's got to be the best tasting bread, right? Right? And they begin to follow Jesus and we have the whole boat on the water scene as well, but the crowds catch up and and Jesus says to them, you're you're striving after me, you're labouring for the food of the belly, strive for the food that doesn't perish. And then we move into the bread of life narrative, I am the bread of life. Then Jesus uh, has a teaching which is very confronting. 
Jesus begins to say to them, not only is he the bread of life, but that they would have to eat his flesh and drink his blood if they would have a part with him in the kingdom. Now, immediately, everybody in the crowd is thinking cannibalism. What is this guy talking about, right? But there are a few there that get it. Let's read what happens. Pick it up after that narrative. Verse 60. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. The question is, is the saying hard or is your heart hard? Uh, I've I've had many people come and say, you know, I want to talk to you about a passage that I read and, and we sit down and immediately begins with, you know what, this is a hard passage. And usually the conversation is, you know what, the passage isn't hard to understand. It might be hard to digest and swallow and it might have huge implications in your life. But but relatively speaking, the Word of God is not hard to understand. We're going to see where the lack was in a moment, but but many are beginning to say, you know what, this is a hard saying. Uh, Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples... The word disciple, it's not just followers. This isn't a crowd. This isn't a bunch of groupies that hitch for a ride. This is a disciple. These guys had been following Jesus for some time. In fact, just a slight digression. By the time we get to the first chapter of Acts, as some may remember, there was a crowd that had been following Jesus for some time. In fact, the disciples, when they wanted to replace Judas, said, we must pick one who has been with us from the beginning. But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling, best way to understand the word grumbling is when people offer criticism without a solution. That's what grumbling means. Grumbling means sometimes, doesn't matter where it comes from, constructive criticism can be your best friend. Doesn't matter where it comes from, even if it is from your enemy. But if any kind of criticism that doesn't offer a solution is just grumbling and having a gripe. They were grumbling about this and they said to, and he said to them, do you take offence at this? FYI, Jesus was, Jesus is offensive. The gospel is offensive. For those that want to continue in their lifestyle without making any kind of repentant change, the gospel is offensive. For those that want to go through life and have all of God in one hand and all of their pet sins in the other, the gospel and Jesus is very offensive. The religious people of the day found it enormously offensive because they wanted to continue in their self-righteous, pious ways when the gospel calls for us to receive not construct our own righteousness. Uh, they, do you take offence? Uh, offence is a choice. Yeah. You're welcome this morning. Offence is, is a choice and it's also the number one tool in the hands of the enemy to bring you down. Yeah. You're welcome. Let's move on. Uh, <laughs> Do you take offence at this? Verse 62. Then then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. What Jesus is saying is that the Spirit without the Holy Spirit, then human reasoning alone is not not enough to be able to understand. You're offended because in your own human reasoning, you can only see cannibalism, whereas when the Holy Spirit breathes on the Word, we can see beyond it. Uh, We can see uh, Jesus goes on and says, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life, but there are some here who do not believe. And it's interesting because they've been following Christ, right? And often when we use the word believe... We might think, well, believe is just agreeing with a certain amount of facts about Jesus, but that's not the biblical meaning of the word believe. In fact, John uses believe the most, and he uses it 99 times in his gospel, and every time he uses the word believe, it is a decision that is casting the fullness of our trust and reliance upon Christ. It's not just agreeing with facts, it's about the whole lifestyle of a person, completely redirected. Jesus says there's some here who don't believe because of wrong motives. They're maybe worldly materialism. Uh, In fact, we find young Judas 
the whole time has been motivated by political interest. Judas is the only disciple of any that might have come from the area of Judah. And what we see was his notion of a Messiah was an earthly kingdom and a prominent position for him. The minute Jesus spoke about dying and suffering, Judas is like, that's not what I signed up for, champ. Give me the money back. Jesus says there's some here that do not believe. Let's keep reading on. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those who were who did not believe and those who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by my father. Verse 66. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. And the deficiency is not in Christ and it's not in his word. And when I read that passage, I thought, you know what? There is a lot about John chapter 6 that sounds a lot like the church today. There's a lot of people that are following Christ for the wrong motives. There are a lot of people maybe that have summed up belief as being agreeing with a certain amount of facts as we covered last week, following Christ sometimes. Uh, when is about his word, finding the good soil in our hearts. It means that we endure through hardship. We found that uh, emotionalism is not true discipleship following Jesus is not, well, okay, I feel like it today. Jesus never came to talk about your feelings. But many turned back and you missed out. Maybe even as we're reading this verse, maybe in our minds and in our hearts, we're thinking of family members. Maybe we're thinking of friends that once walked with Christ and have, mm. have drifted or, yeah. or for whatever reason have, have walked away. So what does discipleship look like? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I love this quote. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, discipleship is not an offer man makes to Christ. Discipleship is not us coming to Jesus saying, come follow me, Jesus. <laughs> That's not how it works. And it's also not an offer, hey, you know what, I might hang around you, Jesus. That's not what the offer was. When Jesus said to the 12 disciples, when he said, come follow me, they left everything. They left everything. They abandoned everything. I love Peter's response. Simon Peter, answering on behalf of all of the disciples... Simon Peter answered him and said, Lord, discipleship is not merely, not merely about the decisions we make. Discipleship is about lordship. Lord, to whom shall we go? Jesus turns to his disciples and says, do you want to go away as well? And, and Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? What other rabbi will we go to? Who else has the way. We've left everything. Where do you think we're going to go, Jesus? That's what discipleship looks like. Discipleship looks like, to whom else would I go? My heart, my vision here is that we would be a group of disciples that would answer Jesus with exactly the same words. Where else will I go? The world has nothing for me, Lord. Uh, where else will I go? Uh, politicians come up empty-handed, Lord. Our earthly rulers might come up empty-handed. Humans will always come up empty-handed. Uh, Jesus is the only one that can make us whole and meet our needs. Where else will I go? Why would Peter say that? Because... As Peter goes on and says, because we have believed, we're convinced. We have believed and we've come to know that you are the Holy One of God. That's discipleship. That's following Christ. We live in a culture today they're saying the church is irrelevant. We live in a culture today that is telling us, is in some ways asking us that question. Do you want to go away as well? My heart here is that Lord would do a deep work in each one of our lives till we would answer that question exactly the same. Where else will we go? The 
Jesus finishes this passage. I, I love how Jesus finishes verse 70. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? Straight for, all the way from the beginning, he knew who it was. No surprises. Imagine trying to throw a surprise birthday party for Jesus. <laughs> you turn up and he's already there. And of course, he spoke of Judas. And now we ask ourselves the question, okay, Lord, how do we get to that place? How can we get on the path of moving from maybe where we are? How can we go deeper into discipleship? How can we be... Uh, uh, my vision, our vision as a leadership here, our vision is a church of, that would be a part of the solution. Yes, we want to be used by you, Lord, to spread your word, but we also want to grow in you. We want to be able to answer that question like Peter. So how do we move from where we are now to that place. As you're making your way to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, a couple of fun facts for you. The word disciple is used 271 times in the Gospels and 21 times in the book of Acts. And discipleship has mainly three parts. Let me kind of help you to understand what I mean by that. We begin with the part of information. Information is really important. Uh, information looks like what we're doing right now. Information looks like what we, what we do in our life groups. Information looks like sharing the word, preaching the word, those sorts of things. Where we want to arrive at is all the way over here at implementation, where it looks like fruit and it has a part in our lives. That's what we looked at last week with the parable of the sower. Uh, blessed are those who hear the word and do it. That's, so we want to move from not just information, but also where it is a part of our lives. That's discipleship. But there's a missing link in the middle. And the interesting thing is that uh, after Acts chapter 21, the word disciple completely drops out of the New Testament. And we have to ask ourselves the question, why? Did they get a new Great Commission? What happened here? Everything was about discipleship. We, we read about the go disciples in the gospel. We see how Jesus discipled his disciples. But now we're asking yourself, what, what's happened? Have they changed the mandate? What happened after Acts chapter 21 is the gospel began to go to the Greco-Roman world. Wow. And, and what happened when, they, when it started spreading through Asia Minor was they realised, you know what? They have no concept of the disciple-rabbi relationship. No idea at all. If you could go to the pagans, if you like, and speak about discipleship and rabbis, and they just go, okay, they had no idea. But what we do find, Paul never uses the word disciple in any one of his epistles. But what he does speak about is a relationship that they did understand. And it was a relationship between parent and child. Let's have a look at what Paul has to say here. If you've made your way to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, those rambunctious Corinthians, misbehaving a lot they were, at least in the first epistle, they got it right in the second one. Let's read what Paul has to say. We're going to begin at verse 14. Paul says, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. Paul's not saying uh, you're my beloved disciples. That would be true. We might use that word, but that's not what he said. You're my beloved children. Okay, so there's a different relationship. He goes on and expands. I love the words he uses. For though you have countless guides, we'll unpack that word in a moment, uh, in Christ, you do not have many fathers. And the word for guide could be translated guardian or tutor. And in the Greco-Roman world in particular, they had a lot of slaves and servants. And what they would do with the children is uh, up until the age of 13, they would entrust the children to slaves and servants. And the servant would take the child and teach them the what of life. Uh, they would teach them how to read. They would teach them how to write. They would teach them arithmetic, which, yes, okay, kids, I don't know when you're going to use it in life, but you need to do algebra, right? All of those sorts of things. But then at 13, something very powerful happened. Uh, they, uh, they were considered to move from childhood, no teenagers, by the way, in the first century. You went straight from child to adolescent. You were considered to be, at the age of 13, you were considered to be a man and a woman. And the relationship changed. Now they were no longer attached to the guardian or the servant, but they would then attach themselves to the parent. And they would, now the focus is not teaching what, but how. How do I do life? How do I do the family trade? And so there was this parent-child relationship. That's the relationship that Paul 
is speaking of. What does that look like? Let's read it again, verse 15. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ through Je- Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. You have many guardians, not many fathers. Be imitators of me. The missing link between information and implementation is imitation. What a powerful thing. Was Paul off his rocker? Did he have a bit of KLT that morning and go, hey, everybody, follow me. Stop following Jesus and start following me. That's not what Paul is saying. And we're going to unpack that in a moment. Uh, The missing link is to imitate. Imitate is one who follows the example of another, modelling one's life after a godly example. It's not just about outward actions either. It's about their character and their morals. That was the relationship between the parent and the child. And, and speaking into the family right now, I mean, uh, I remember watching a, a, a short clip of a documentary. Uh, it was a longer documentary, but it was an interesting clip that I watched where they asked, uh, basically at that time they asked millennials, do you go to church now? And if they said, well, no, I don't, they would then ask, did you once go to church? Yes, yes, we once went to church. Then the last question was, why don't you go to church today? Two answers that rose to the top. A couple of fruitless ones at the bottom, but two answers rose to the top. First one was, well, with, with the advances in science, we believe that church doesn't have the answers anymore, and so it's irrelevant, which is interesting. The other one was, interestingly enough, our parents never modelled the importance of church. Ouch. Now, that's not... Every instance, I know, that, I know there's people that will say, well, we always modelled the importance of church and Christ and, and, and maybe that the children have wandered away from the truth or whatever that may be. But largely the answer was, you know what, it was never important to our parents. We, we kind of, if we had nothing better to do on a Sunday, we might have gone to church. Our parents, your children will imitate you. Irritate, Yes but they will imitate as well. You've got to be really careful. How many people know you've got to be really careful what you say around a toddler when they're learning to speak? (laughs) Everyone's like, all of us, right? Howard Hendricks says, you teach what you know, but you reproduce what you are. Maybe it was just a one-off. Maybe Paul was just having one of those quirky days. Maybe it just applied to the Corinthians. You know, they were, they were a misbehaving lot. Maybe Paul was just trying to correct a few things. Well, it turns out that's not the case. Uh, to those <laughs> frivolent Galatians, those foolish Galatians, he says in chapter 4, verse 12, he says, become as I am. He uses this language throughout his epistles. Uh, Philippians 3, verse 17, he says, join in imitating me. Not irritating, imitating. I know they're close. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 6 says, you became imitators of us. 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 7 says that they ought to imitate us. Why? Verse 9 says, because we gave you an example to imitate. That's a huge challenge that Paul's laying down to every one of us. How do we become church? Paul says... In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's my vision for church. Step one for all of us. Step one is be a disciplined follower of Jesus of Nazareth. That's step one. Learn the ways of Jesus. Learn the character and the morals of Jesus. And as you are following Jesus, turning around to see who's imitating you. Uh, I have learned uh, in the secular world, I have learned uh, when people know you're a Christian, they are watching you. It, we'll get to another question in a moment, but if you're on trial for being a Christian today, 
is there enough evidence to convict you? Who or what are we imitating? As we draw to a close, uh, Howard Hendricks again says, you cannot impart what you do not possess. The call for us is to possess a vibrant, dynamic relationship with the living Saviour, Jesus of Nazareth, but also that we would be people that would impart that. And here's the one question I leave everybody as we move into next year. Do you live a life worth imitating? I don't, I don't ask that question this morning to condemn anybody, but to pose a challenge to everybody is the life that you live. If somebody was imitating your ways, if somebody was observing your life, if somebody was to pattern their life after yours, are you living in such a manner that you would want somebody to imitate you? I was enormously challenged. The good news for me is I get asked all these questions before you guys. My heart is that, and there are logistics uh, as an eldership and, uh, and as a board of directors, there are logistics that we will put around this. Logistics and how we want to train and teach people and, and so forth. But discipleship is actually a natural, organic thing. It looks like, uh, sometimes we overcomplicate it, but maybe it looks like, you know what, how about we get together once a week and just read the Word and pray. It doesn't have to be massive groups. You don't have to be running a church. It can be two, three people. And you're in a close group and you, you take somebody under your arm. We have to begin to answer the question, one, who's discipling me? And the second one is, who am I discipling? Who am I pouring my life into? Does that mean you have to be perfect? No. Can't be. Only pastors are perfect, right? <laughs> As we move into next year, I leave you this challenge of discipleship. We want to be a church that grows deeper. Deeper looks like... Not one person up the front, not, not one person with a cup, but everybody discipling everybody. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the greatest invitation that was issued by Jesus, which was, come, follow me, which is, come, follow me. As we seek to follow you more diligently, we pray that we would be an example worthy of imitation. Our prayer as we go into next year, Lord, is we want to go deeper. We want to grow stronger. But we want to go deeper. And we ask for the help of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name.